Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. We are back at Dirty Habit, one of our favorite restaurants in Washington, D.C. It's the name of the restaurant, not a proclivity of ours, just to be clear. It's in the Monaco Hotel, downtown Washington, D.C. You know, folks, I am, I think obsessed is a proper verb, obsessed with voting in this country. It really matters. I have two guests, a Republican and a Democrat. They are secretaries of state in their respective states. Adrian Fontes, Democrat from Arizona, is here. And Scott Schwab, who is the Republican Secretary of State of Kansas and also the president of the National Association sure. of Secretaries of State. Gentlemen, good to see you. Thank you. Honored to be here. Great, Great to be Do I need to call you Mr. President today? No. <laughs> no. No POTUS necessary here. No POTUS necessary. <laughs> Until I get my own security detail, it's just Scott. <laughs> Adrian, let's start with you uh, as... My listeners and viewers know uh, Arizona is unquestionably a frontline state in the battle for what is democracy in our country, the means by which we can coherently, legally, verifiably, and transparently count votes and report results. What is the state of affairs in Arizona today? The state of affairs in Arizona today is as it has been for decades. We are continuously and still running good elections. Uh, that can be counted on. Um, we have uh, solid professionals, albeit uh, now less experienced professionals because we've lost a lot of folks because of the misinformation, disinformation, and the threats that uh, a lot of folks have suffered. Uh, but we're in pretty good shape, uh, all things considered. And our new folks that are coming in uh, are coming in eyes wide open. They understand the environment. They understand the pressures that they're going to be under. Nonetheless, they are dedicated to making sure that democracy works, uh, not just for Arizona, but for the rest of the country. I mean, we're all kind of in this together. And so um, I think we're in good shape. Now, that slightly uh, damaged lack of experience, if you will, may give rise to human error here and there. But as long as the conspiracy theorists don't attack it too much, uh, don't misframe it too much, uh, make a bigger deal out of it than what it is, um, I think we're going to be just fine. What is the state of play, Scott Schwab, in Kansas? I, uh, and your <laughs> overall assessment of where the nation stands as president of the Secretary of State? So. Yeah, I did, we're, as an association, I'll start there and then kind of come down to my home state, is we're dealing with what he's dealing with. A lot of election officials coming out of COVID, that was an incredibly stressful environment. Yep. So we lost a lot of our more senior election officials. And then, you know, getting threats. I mean, I've got a county that has maybe 5,000 people in it in Kansas. And she got a phone call at the office saying, I just want you to know we're parked outside your parents' house. She okay. being who? The clerk, the clerk. The county clerk. They're threatening her parents. And she's in her 60s. Her parents are in her 90s. What county is this? Uh, I'm not going to, okay. I don't want to call anybody out. But it's really sad because, and several. What clerks, effect did that have on this clerk? <laughs> she's just like, well, you're, she was actually, she's pretty fiery. She says, well, if you kill them, it saves me time. And calling their bluff. And so that's why I don't want their name. Filed because, under gallows humor, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it's, but she's just calling their bluff. But it's a county of 5,000 people. I mean, who's going to do a presidential fraud election in a county of 5,000? I mean, right. if okay, let's just say for some odd reason there was a conspiracy in Kansas to get Biden to win Kansas. He, one, he failed. You right. committed multiple felonies just to fail. And two, that ain't the county you're focusing on. Right. Um, but we, it, a lot of these folks that are spreading these rumors and just constantly trying to find a reason why their person lost, logic is not a part of the cranium. It has been lost, and there's no critical thinking. And there's there's just uh, discontent that has it, boiled it over well, into conspiratorial have, allegations. Yes, and then you have people that have, and I, I, I love the phrase that was in the Wall Street Journal that said, this has become an industry. Mm -hmm. People are yeah. raising and making money almost like a ministry. I know people that give Dr. Franks $200 a month to help his cause. I'm like, but he's been disproven. You know, their mind's made up. Don't confuse them with facts. And, and it really all stems from what you said. Their guy lost. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what this is about. It's about this brand new thing in America called sore loserism. And at the highest levels of leadership, it can become dangerous to the entire society. Like everything that we do hinges on elections, right? And I liken it to, I've used this metaphor before, you know, law, medicine, the arts and sciences, industry, travel, they're all different fabrics in this 
or, or they're different threads in this fabric. And, and, and elections are the golden thread that hold it together. And because one guy got pissed off because he lost the election, there's a whole bunch of people trying to pull that golden thread out that would disintegrate everything. And the people that are suffering the most are these local clerks. Yeah. Right? And, they're, they're, and, they're, and, and many of them, frankly, are women. Oh, and, yes. And, and yes. the majority of them are women. And Many so of the victims of this. We're really who talking the threats, about the text messages, the emails, the voicemail messages. And they're really kind of horrible. So, you know, you got a clerk that's got fiery, like you said, and has got some gallows humor. I know some folks who have suffered significant uh, emotional damage, yeah. post traumatic stress. Yeah, you know, we've got, a, we've got one in, in Arizona who's, uh, who had two of her dogs poisoned uh, as a means of intimidation. Uh, we've had folks, yeah, yeah. We have, we've had folks that have, you know, suffered some real hardships. We, my, my own family and I have been, have, have been threatened. Yes. And so this is, this is a serious problem because what they're doing is they're biting at the core of what holds us together and they're destroying the faith that we have in one another as citizens, that civic faith that we should be able to share even across party lines. Scott, you mentioned this idea of a grift. Is a denialist industrial complex too strong a word it's nothing new um i mean, I mean that there's money to be made there's money to be made in yeah. election well, denialism in a, yes but now it's a more commoner industry i would go back to like bush v gore and some other times where it was the attorneys who made money off challenging elections and now it's not the, the attorneys simpler time. yeah <laughs> uh, yeah it's so much easier back then can we just go back to hanging chads please um but um He's joking, folks. I, am I promise joking, you, he's please, joking about me. that. Those we don't want any more was, hanging chads. There was, there's horrible equipment. Um, but there's always been people that have struggled with losing. I mean, Hillary didn't announce, nope. concede. She did concede. She called she, Trump. But not that night. Yes, yeah, she did. She called. She called that she morning. Called that morning. She okay, called you that morning. More than I, me. I, I, I finally had to go to, the to bed. I'm recording. like, we got our job done. I listened to the actual recording. You can read about it in my book, Mr. Trump's Wild Ride. And by I will the way. be reading it. <laughs> um, but the the other interesting thing is, but even Stacey Abrams in in Georgia, yes. she had she she was angry and couldn't accept loss. And this can but it filed used, five lawsuits, lost them all. In and Georgia. that's it was all the attorneys that were making money back mm -hmm. then. Now it's not the attorneys. Now it's people who can get clicks on YouTube and make money by spreading similar conspiracies that in a lawsuit never would get court, but I don't have to go to court. I just need public <clears throat> opinion to cut me a check. Well, and the difference I think is stark here. We didn't have a coordinated effort nationwide to overturn the actual results. And then what has spurred since then. That's, that's the, the stark difference here. You have individual candidates being sore losers. That's not new, yeah. right? But this, and I think you properly kind of put it into like this industry right that has popped up and one of the most disturbing parts for for folks uh who are sort of in the hotbed of this stuff I'm, i happen to be one of them um we've got sitting legislators who are just cannot come to terms with facts we've got lawmakers in congress who cannot come to terms with reality and that's that's it's damaging to the body politic that's the voice of Adrian Fontes, the Secretary of State of Arizona. Scott Schwab, Secretary of State of Kansas, is also with us. When we come back, I'm going to talk to Adrian Fontes about a member of the legislature in Arizona who wants to uh, ascribe electoral votes only by the legislature. No voting required whatsoever. We'll talk about that in segment two when we come back. We're expanding who it is that has power and who has voice. And he wants to contract that in almost a violent way. Welcome back to The Takeout. Dirty Habit is our restaurant, one of our favorite places in the Monaco Hotel, downtown Washington, D.C. Adrian Fontes, Democratic Secretary of State, Arizona. Scott Schwab, Republican Secretary of State, Kansas, our guest. So, Adrian, as you know, there is a member of the Arizona legislature, Republican. His name is State Senator Anthony Kern, who has introduced legislation that would have the electoral votes in Arizona assigned entirely by the legislature, removing any consideration of what the popular vote total in Arizona actually was. You might be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, this is not flagrantly unconstitutional. The Constitution does create that choice, 
But as ri- many articles written about this suggestion have pointed out, Arizona has never done it that way. And since the mid-1800s, no state in America has done it this way. Well, we weren't a state until well after. That was right. no longer uh, even part of the exercise. And, um, yeah, I mean, look. What does that tell you? Well, it tells and- me that there may be some validity to the old saying that we put the AZ in crazy. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that I, I just, I don't understand how someone who pretends to be so fervently patriotic would be so willing to cast asunder the rights of his fellow citizens and just say, none of you matter. The only people that matter are me and the, my cronies here at the legislature. Well, and that, that's, that's hard to stomach when all we've ever done in this country is include more and more and more and more people into the, the process. franchise of voting, into <clears throat> the voting. We have one American tradition that you can almost always rely on is that we're expanding who it is that has power and who has voice. And he wants to contract that in almost a violent way down to what the, the I don't even, I haven't even read it yet, the, the, the 30 senators and 60 the representatives. The legislature and no other official shall appoint presidential electors. Yeah, so like, <laughs> that's it? Right. Scott, and this is a Republican. I'm a Republican, and I'm like, basically, you're a Republican that wants to expand government. (laughs) Well, not only expand government, but 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 take uh, take the people completely take the people out of it. But yeah, I know. It's just like okay. So the whole point of Reagan conservatism is the old line: "I'm from the government." The last thing you want to hear is, "I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. I don't need your help. I'm a responsible American. I don't need help from the government." Then in comes Republican legislators in the AZ of crazy saying, "No, we do want the government because we don't trust our citizens to make a good choice." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, "And you call yourself a Republican? I call you a populist. There is nothing Republican about that." Mm-hmm. Well, All right, it's, I'm it's, sorry. It's, it's, it's well, your and, and I would, I would, I would just say. I, I, it, to me, it's not even populism. That's the epitome of elitism. Mm-hmm. That's the epitome of saying none of you unwashed masses out there matter. None of your opinions matter. None of we will pick your president for you, and you'll just be subjugated to that. And if you if you look at some of the things that are really coming out of this our Freedom Caucus in Arizona, I won't I won't speak to what's happening in Kansas or elsewhere because I really don't know. But it's 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 this bizarre elitism. Like we're the only ones that can tell you how to do this, how to do that. And speaking of Reagan conservatism, the overreach of the state legislature into so many other areas. I mean, uh, for the last several years, this, the Arizona state legislature has wanted to tell cities what they can do and tell counties what they can do and tell school districts what they can do. Absolutely trying to... Subverting the old idea of local control is the more informed 100%. and democratic and, and, and that to me, which I believe was consistent with... Reaganism, new federalism, all yep. those sorts of ideas. Yeah, and you you could listen to Arizona Democrats. We sound more like Reagan Republicans <laughs> I, than the current Republicans. Do. I, I, and I can't I can't believe it. This is gonna I'm gonna get so many comments on Just this, but it. I'm gonna be honest. Say it. Our Democrat governor gave one of the most Republican state of the state addresses this month or last month. I guess we're in February now. Mm-hmm. Um, then I've heard from Republicans that I've served with in the legislature when I was there. And well, a legislator came out and said, her tax plan is 75% of what I want. I never get 75% of what I want out of a tax plan. And so it is kind of this situation of, and, and she's been helpful to me as I've battled some crazy ideas in our state to mm-hmm. know it's like, hey, I just know they're not going to override a veto. You succeeded Chris Kobach as Secretary of State yes, of Kansas. Yeah. He has a reputation. And now he's my attorney. Is he? He's our attorney general now, right, so he's exactly. my attorney. So what was that like, and how did you differentiate, and how do you differentiate your relationship to voting, what is or isn't legitimate about it, from what Chris Kobach brought to that conversation. So Chris and I have a history um, because he ran for Congress, I think, in 2004. And I was running for my second term in the legislature. He's a little older than me, but not much. Our wives were always pregnant at the same time, so they get along very well. Mm -hmm. And then I was chair of elections when he was secretary of state and we got our voter ID bill passed. 
and it was bipartisan support. Um, I think there was only like eight no votes on it, and we worked really diligently with the NAACP to be. They actually they were the best critics of the bill because we didn't realize our bill was so unconstitutional until the NAACP came in and pointed out how unconstitutional it was. So and, they helped you refine. Oh, it. they absolutely did. I I have a lot of respect for the NAACP in Kansas because they were able. If, if, if folks will listen to that group in Kansas, they help you make your bills better. The problem is they're labeled as liberal, so nobody wants to listen to them, so there's no critical thinking. And they were incredibly helpful to me as a chairman. And then we got the bill passed, and Chris was Secretary of State appreciated it. And, um, but none of the crimes, none of the fraud really came to fruition. And so then when I became Secretary of State, I campaigned on, we're not gonna do anything drastic because it's gonna increase voter confusion if we can increase poll anything we do is going to be on the back end you know it's not going to be on the front end so that voter engagement doesn't change ah, that snacky lunch i mentioned has oh, now there arrived there we go goodness uh, sprouts over towards these guys <laughs> that <laughs> smells like gold yeah, keep the onion rings close to adrian those yeah, were his special request exactly i'm gonna need a small plate that is <laughs> oh my word i see what is your favorite yeah, enjoy place. enjoy those guys. i may not go back to work <laughs> How do you worst not like Brussels sprouts? Because I don't. And don't try to sell me on them. It's just not going to happen. Elections on which we agree, I Brussels got, sprouts, yeah, we I clearly vote, do not. I vote no on that side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> and you will respect my choice, so, sir. I want to ask you both I, I about... I lost where we're at. <laughs> it's all right. F food has a tendency to distract. I want to ask you about something. We're recording this on February 6th, um, as my audience does know very well. Sometimes we talk about things that have just happened, and I'm going to do that today because a three-judge panel here at the Federal D.C. Court of Appeals rendered a judgment, a unanimous judgment, on former President Trump's assertion of absolute immunity in relationship to actions he took leading up to and on January 6th. Oh, today. Yes, today. I haven't seen it. The and court ruled, and I'm going to quote from this directly, we cannot accept former President Trump's claim. This was a unanimous 52-page decision from three judges on the D.C. Federal Court of Appeals. We cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power, the recognition and implementation of election results. Nor can we sanction his apparent contention that the executive has carte blanche to violate the rights of individual citizens to vote and to have their votes counted. Adrian Fontes, your reaction? Duh. I mean, <laughs> That's no kidding. That's your attorney response, right? Yeah, I mean, I went to law school. Uh, yeah, no kidding. The rule of law, I mean, look, it says on the building, equal justice under law. And no, look, we got rid of uh, titles of honor in the Constitution. We got rid of all of that stuff. There's nobody's above the law. We got and rid of a monarchy. And I will tell you right now, I'm frankly quite disappointed in the Department of Justice in, in, in you know, slow rolling some of this stuff, right? I think they should have acted a lot more quickly. And I've made those criticisms where I've spoken with them. They're moving to change and things are happening. And I'm glad about that. But yeah, no kidding, bro. You don't get to do... You don't get to order assassinations just because of political rivals. I mean, that was one of the things he was saying that he could do. And if that's the case, he's arguing for Joe Biden to be able to knock him off, which is stupid. So come on. Like, again, my response is three letters long, and it's something akin to what don't Homer Simpson would say. <laughs> oh, don't. Yeah, no Scott, kidding. I'm going to give you 20 seconds while you uh, chew your Brussels oh, sprout. Uh, Brussels jump sprout. in, and then I'll let you carry on on the other side of the break. It it. it a Do you find anything to fault with that, what I just read? I would say that the argument has... Attorneys represent their clients. Yeah. And their goal is to get their client to win, even no matter how exaggerated the argument is. Do I think Donald Trump's making that argument? No. He's paying his attorneys to make an argument that he can win somehow. We'll take that up on the other side of the break. That's yes, Scott Schwab, will. Adrian Fontes. I'm Major Garrett. Dirty habit. Our lunch has arrived, and it's really good. Even uh, the Brussels sprouts. We'll I see you in a minute. I do not like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Our job is not to run up the score. Our job is to make sure the rules are followed and the people who are allowed to participate get the, uh, that opportunity. Welcome back to Takeout Pro Tip. A very good lunch. I mean, really good lunch. Brussels sprouts, French fries, onion rings. That's all you need. Forget all the other stuff, especially here at Dirty Habit. 
Adrian Fontes, Scott Schwab. Adrian is the Democratic Secretary of State of Arizona. Scott, Republican Secretary of State of Kansas. I'm going to find fault with what you just said before we went to break, Scott. Oh, let yes, me. the attorneys are making the argument. But you cannot ignore the truth social posts authored by oh. the former president that say this exact thing, that he and every president needs absolute authority, and without absolute authority, the presidency will cease to function. He's made that argument himself. Oh, I, I agree with you. And the court today, February 6th, on a three-judge panel, unanimously rejected that okay. in this context. There's one thing on saying it on social. There's another thing making the argument in court. No, hold um, on. And wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm not saying it's okay. Okay. I'm not. I'm not <clears throat> saying. Oh, and they're allowed to. Which technically they are. Allowed, any. I mean, you can order? make an argument in you court. You can make yes, any of type of argument right. you want. His due process but rights have been protected. Be he can make an with argument. You, yeah. in, I took my LSAT and I accidentally got elected, so I didn't go to law school. <laughs> um, but. And it's, as, my attorney friends would be like, my license, I, I'm not putting my license on the line for that argument. Right. And, would and, you agree and, with that? I would, I would agree. Do, and you, I would. do you find fault with that argument? With the argument Trump's making? Yes. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I just oh, want you and, on the record. So, and it goes back to, this is not the Reagan Republicanism that we've come to know. And, and being from Bob Dole, it's not what Bob Dole would want. I mean, Bob Dole thought, I mean, he ate dirt on foreign soil and became disabled to protect the freedoms that we have. It's not so that he'd fight for a president that can kill willy-nilly. I, I, will, I will tell you right now, I applaud your defense of what so many Americans understand as republicanism. But I, I have to push back a little bit on any defense of Mr. Trump. And, I'm not saying and I'm his, defending and, him. I'm and just his saying, arguments. let's be honest, his attorneys are the ones his making their argument. Well, but they're not going to make the argument without him telling them to. Because Precisely. you can't, you can't yeah. do what you're, you can't do something that's against what your client's saying. He, he authorized it. He's okay. the boss. I'll, I'll, and, I'll, he I'll, he's, and he I'll echoes it on social that. media. Yeah. 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 No, and, and so, so the bottom line is he's responsible for the argument. He's flat wrong. Well, he's responsible wrong. for a lot of things. And, and, and he needs um, to be held accountable. And, and, and I think that... He should be held accountable. He should be held accountable for all the nonsense that he's created because he has engineered this crazy... Look, but to pay, uh, not too many not too long from a minute ago, ago, Adrian, you mentioned that you have been critical of the Department of Justice. If this had been charged earlier, if a special counsel had been appointed earlier, this would not be bumping up against the election season in the That's way that correct. it currently is. Is that one of the reasons you fault the Justice Department? Yes, my... Most recent criticism of the Department of Justice was that they were really slow to investigate and prosecute folks who have been harassing election officials. And I consider that to be domestic terrorism. I mean, the definition of terrorism is the threat or use of violence against someone to reach a political end. And when you're threatening election officials, it's a political end. That's the only reason to motivate, that, that right. would motivate you. They're not treating it like domestic terrorism, and that's why I criticize them. I have spoken with the Department of Justice, I've spoken with the FBI since then, and we are working together to make sure that they're getting the stuff done that they need to get done. And I think that it's important that folks know these are the kinds of dialogues that have to happen in our society. You're supposed to be able to criticize folks, and I've specifically said the White House needs to stay the heck out of it, because that's what would make it political. But when it comes to the pointed issue here, you cannot have immunity in this way um, that, that, that was advocated for and approved by Mr. Trump. By the client. And yeah. that's, that's, you just can't. It doesn't, it is unreasonable on its face. And well, I'm really surprised that any lawyer would stand before a court of competent jurisdiction and make that argument. I want to ask you about something that else happened on February 6th, the day we're recording this, because I think it's going to be an issue that everyone in the election space will deal with in 2024. You're like dropping these grenades when we haven't a chance. Well, he's <laughs> he's I'm feeding you. Homework, I'm feeding. Right. I'm also feeding you. So I'm eat not up. Gonna argue. Yeah. And fortify yourself. So in New Hampshire today, the Department of Justice of the State of New Hampshire and the FCC issued a cease and desist order against something called Life Corporation, Lingo Telecom and Walter Monk for putting out a AI generated robocall that mimicked President Biden's voice before the New Hampshire primary, misinforming those who received the call mm -hmm. about the date of that primary. Okay. This is an AI-generated thing that made it sound very much like President Biden. So my okay. question is, how big a concern is AI in this space? Scott, go ahead. Um, 
and Adrian, I'm going to give credit to him because he has TSMC in Arizona. He's been dealing more with um, technology and semiconductors, what's going on in Arizona. There's a difference between, and that so many folks misinterpret what we do. And I wrote a co-piece with um, Jen Easterly, the director of CISA, that was in... Um, can you remember the magazine now? It's, it's been reproduced everywhere. But basically, my, the point I want in that article is we don't do campaigns. Right. We do elections. My concern with AI is not that a candidate, someone uses AI to misrepresent a candidate. I don't do that. I'm the referee. If, if I'm a referee on a basketball court, which I'm still mourning the loss of KU's game last night, um, but I digress. Um, the same I, you grad is not, by the uh, way, for the record. Yeah, I know. Care I, less about I, for, KU. <laughs> We'll be in the tournament this year. So anyway, <laughs> I don't even know what conference I'm in anymore at Arizona State. Right. So you so guys are lucky. We, um, but you know, our job is not to say, "Oh, that's not the real player. This is the real player." That's not our, our job. Is not to run up the score. Our job is to make sure the rules are followed right. and the people who are allowed to participate get the, uh, that opportunity as so chosen. Um, if that's a campaign issue. My concern is, is somebody doing the same robocall as my voice saying, right. due to the increased turnout of voting, we're extending the election one more day into Wednesday. If you So Democrats, please vote on Wednesday. And stupid stuff like that. Or this that. precinct has been moved or something yes. like that. Or ch changing to anything where, it's, where it causes election confusion in the actual process of the election. Yes, and we are working our legislature to make that a law. Yeah, so we've got um, some of our colleagues, um, Steve Simons in, uh, is it Minnesota, Minnesota or Wisconsin? I can Minnesota. I always get those two confused. Um, they've got a, a great uh, set of statutes that they just Minnesotans passed. Minnesotans get Arizona and New Mexico confused, just that's, for the record. That's, that's fine. You know, I, I don't take it personally. I know Arizona's <laughs> better. Nobody gets Missouri and Kansas confused. No, Never. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Point is... Um, there's already some folks that are at, at sort of at the at the head of this and, and moving through. The, the, like I said, there's some great legislation up there. We just had a tabletop exercise in Arizona where we brought together 200 election administrators and we worked through some of the threats that generative artificial intelligence portray. We had experts from across the country, from Palo Alto, from a lot of these companies come in and talk to our elections officials to tell them what, what, to, rec what to recognize and sort of kind of become familiar with what this thing is. Because you can't fight it if you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. and I don't disagree that this is this is a threat, but it's a it's not new, it's an amplifier and it's an it, it, it's an enabler to what we've already seen. So I remember a municipal election not too many years ago, in uh, in the city of Tempe, mm -hmm. Arizona, right in Maricopa County, where one of the campaigns mistakenly put out the wrong day for election day. They put the wrong day on their flyer. Okay, now imagine that somebody did that, but it was through social, a social media post right. generated by artificial intelligence and it went to a gazillion people instead of just those voters in those precincts. Again, not a new problem, but a new tool that the bad guys are engaging in because you gotta be purposeful in creating this stuff. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, that law enforcement gets all over this and I'm 100% behind New Hampshire and the officials there that are chasing this down and are gonna, and I hope they prosecute it vigorously. I hope they prosecute it fiercely and quickly, and I hope they get some big penalties because this is dangerous. It's very dangerous. The voice of Adrian Fontes. When we come back, you'll see that I'll have reached across the table and gotten me some of these onion rings. Our con continued conversation, we come back. Segment four is coming your way. Oh, see, it's just happening right now. Thanks, Adrian. Back in a minute. The incitement of a riot is a felony in Arizona. The words have meaning. Not all speech is protected by the First Amendment. <laughs> Welcome back to The Takeout and our very fortifying lunch of Brussels sprout onion rings, french fries. That really is all you need, folks. Here at Dirty Habit, Monaco Hotel, downtown D.C. Adrian Fontes, Democratic Secretary of State, Arizona. Scott Schwab, Republican Secretary of State, Kansas. You probably thought you'd get out of here and have lunch and not have to talk about the 14th Amendment. Wrong. You're going to have to talk about it. <laughs> That's the center square on the bingo card anymore. <laughs> it is. Uh, Adrian, your impressions of 
the debate as it currently stands and any expectations you do or do not have about what the Supreme Court will rule on this momentous question. What do I think the Supreme Court's going to do? Well, your guess is as good as mine. You know, this is a six to three, uh, very conservative Supreme Court. It's going to be for a long time, and they're going to have to face the consequences of this decision for a very do long time. Do you think time. Trump should be on the ballot? I don't know that he should be on the general ballot because general I election. don't know what the, what the voters have said. But I do know that he belongs on Arizona's presidential primary ballot because in Arizona the statute says that if two other states put him on the ballot, I'm obliged to put him on the ballot. Okay. So the law tells me that I have to put him on the ballot, and that's what I know. Um, you know, my, my personal opinions and my personal votes, I, I try to keep them a little closer mm -hmm. to the vest, but you can, you, can, you can guess by the D behind my name what I think Do you about have an, whether or not he... an opinion you know. about what the Colorado Supreme Court ruled and the ruling itself? Well, I think the Colorado Supreme Court very interestingly reversed the district court where they said that the presidency is not an office of the United States of America. But the district court had laid out a very, very detailed factual case as to why disqualification was important. And the only hook they left was, uh, or the district court judge left, I think uh, that particular judge said, it, but it doesn't apply because the presidency is not an office. So <coughs> reversing that one piece allowed all of the rest of those facts to come into that ruling. I think the U.S. Supreme Court is going to have a tough time getting around those factual findings because at the end of the day, they're an appellate court, and they can't refine facts. they right. got to go with the facts that were found at the trial court level. So this is a really, really interesting conundrum. If you are on the U.S. Supreme Court and you don't want to disqualify Mr. Trump, you're going to have a hard time uh, working your way around that. Scott Schwab? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that you don't have to be found guilty first. Um, my concern of insurrection. Yeah, right. Um, he hasn't been tried, and so I don't want the arbitrary authority as a secretary of saying, "Well, I think you did, so therefore I can take you off the ballot." And a bigger concern, and we shared um, a lot of Republicans wrote, and I it was actually very nonpartisan intent intentionally when Missouri Secretary Ashcroft wrote an opinion, an amicus brief to the court, because if the more nonpartisan it is, the more people we get to sign on. But it's basically saying, what happens if I have one county that says he can't be on the ballot? Mm -hmm. Now it gets really deeper still is what if you have somebody else then retaliatory says, well, I think Biden for X, Y, Z shouldn't, be on, the shouldn't be on the ballot. And you can say, but there's no trial. You're 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 taking it out of the three branch system and you're putting it in local officials that can use it for personal use as opposed to going to an actual process to say this person's ballot name is not on the ballot here's where i get concerned where this is going let's say trump is elected he becomes the nominee which is not for certain yet um he becomes elected as president and then found guilty of insurrection and then the democrats in congress say we're going to take the electors away and appoint somebody else because he's now guilty of insurrection i think that's where the big problem is going to be is after the general, if he wins the election, you're going to have people on the far left say he is guilty of insurrection. So now they're the ones that are going to try to overturn an election. And that's where this gets really scary. And as Republicans gave them the roadmap on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, we're just doing what the Republicans did four years ago or tried to do. That's where I really get concerned. And the, and the Republicans aren't going to be able to say, well, that you can't do that. Well, you started this fight. So, so I think, yeah, I, I think first and foremost... You know, um, Scott's a good guy, and I disagree with him. I don't think you need a criminal conviction, and neither does the law. It doesn't say you have to be convicted. Uh, and, and this of is, insurrection. So this is a, of insurrection. To be this is a this is a this is a political thing, right? And and I I say political with a little p. This isn't a partisan thing. It is. Did you and did the post you do this? The Civil other, War history of this being actually put into motion did not require convictions. Right. And we also have individuals later on who were never convicted in any other trials being reinstated or having that th that that Section three uh, prohibition lifted by an act of Congress. And there were Two no trials. majorities in, in both. Chambers. Right. And there were no there were no trials to convict them of that in the first place. So we know that you don't need a criminal conviction. I know I know some people are asking for that. and That's fine. The, but the other question is, at what point do we allow bad behavior to continue at what point do we allow the call i mean look inciting a riot is a felony in arizona 
Okay, the incitement of a riot is a felony in Arizona. The words have meaning. Not all speech is protected by the First Amendment. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. These are legal precepts and, and, and concepts that we understand to be true. And at some stage of the game, we have to hold bad actors accountable. The way we hold them accountable is pretty well laid out already. And so, you know, I take a little bit of uh, issue with this. We uh, you're going to get the last yeah, word. Yeah, my concern is I don't want that arbitrary authority. As I'm a secretary. A secretary. I am not a policymaker. And so I don't want that authority. I want the court to tell me. The number of times I get sued and I welcome the lawsuit because I said, the law's unclear. Your Honor, you tell us what to do, we'll do it. We partner with the branches of government. I don't always try to fight against them. I don't want the arbitrary authority to say, no, this is not your day. I'm the secretary and you're off the ballot. That puts every secretary in a bad spot. Whereas the court can use a legal opinion to say what we can and cannot do. And I think there's safety in that. That was the voice of Scott Schwab, Republican Secretary of State, Kansas. Our other guest, Adrian Fontes, Democratic Secretary of State of Arizona. And as I mentioned, stay tuned for your takeout outtake, Especial. That's next. I'm a Phil Collins guy. Great. Genesis all day long. That's fantastic. Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. I'm Major Garrett. Our host restaurant, Dirty Habit. Our lunch is a dirty habit. It's it a is. bunch of fried it is. food. Yes, it is. It is not trainer compliant. I would be the first to admit that. Crispy That's Brussels fantastic. sprouts, yeah. onion rings, French fries. Adrian Fontes, Democratic Secretary of State, great state of Arizona. Scott Schwab, Republican Secretary of State, great state of Kansas. Our guests. Adrian, uh, I cut you off because we had to go. But any other th thoughts you had on Fourteenth Amendment? accountability thereof yeah i i definitely think that we as a society have to come to terms with whether or not we're going to accept the rule of law we have to come to terms with whether or not certain people are not held accountable because of their fame because of their money because of their station i think we have to come to terms with the rule of law means we are all equal and the common theme that i hear uh, on the on the cheerleaders for the former president is that you know, there's a lot of hedge against the rule of law. There's a lot of hedge against we are all at the end of the day accountable for our actions. And, and, and I don't know that that bodes well for tomorrow. I don't know that that's a good lesson that we should be teaching our kids, that you can act this way and you can do this and you can incite that and it's okay because of who you are celebrity-wise. Scott, jump in. Yeah, I, I, that's a broad brush. Um, I wouldn't say it's okay. But I would say, if, it, if we're going to say, it, we have to decide if we're going to, there's a difference between there's a we and an I. So the question I have is, do I have the authority to do that accounting? It's the, Secretary if, of State. It's yeah. Secretary of State. Yeah. And if I don't. people gave I, you that power, they gave you that power. But I, I would argue they didn't. They gave me the power to put them on the ballot, not to take them off. And I would say the only people who can really take off is, is clearly Kansas statute. U.S. Or statute, direction from the Supreme or Court. Or direction from the court, which is why I'm glad it's going to the court, because then we have direction. I, I would believe that, and it's, again, it's, this is what I love about our, our multi-state system, is if the court says, yeah, you can do that, Kansas is going to pass a law to strip me of that authority, but, because it's not me. Mm -hmm. It's about the next secretary, what are they going to do? Right. And so that's where the accountability would come in. Before we had the especial, both my... Distinguished guests really, especial, what is that? Well, what it is, is the fun and games part of our conversation. Oh, okay. okay. So, three questions. We ask every guest who's been on the show. We're in our eighth year, so everyone loves these questions. They take them on, and the audience digs the answers. I'll start with you, Scott, and then we'll go to Adrian. Here are the three questions. Most influential book in your life and why? All-time favorite movie? Long flight or a long drive? What kind of music are you most likely to listen to to really enjoy something musical that sounds like four questions it's th yeah. three it's, it's three. three it's a, it three? yeah on a long drive what music are you going to listen to oh, 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 oh okay. right. not where are you going so what are you going to listen to okay now uh, give me the first one because book influential book um obviously it, as a being a disciple of jesus i love the bible that's very a broad answer. very broad answer um i'm a big david kavanaugh fan I love 1776. I poured myself learning colonial history, and I would recommend anybody read that book. Um, 
But above that, I read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie mm-hmm. twice a year for eight years straight. Wow. Because I was an arrogant young man and I needed to learn humility. Was. Okay, past was. then. Good. So I'm better than I used was to young. was. <laughs> yes, I was. I had hair too. Um, still working on the humble part. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> next question was Favorite movie? Um, as of right now, I still like The Longest Day with mm-hmm. John Wayne. I mean, it's such a good movie. I have been watching Lincoln. Great because movie. Because that movie really portrays how... Doris Kearns Goodwin was a guest yes. on the show. Yes. Oh, really? And she wrote the book that was the uh, basis for the Tony basis Kushner's movie. screenplay for they, the movie. That movie really was the most accurate Hollywood portrayal on how legislations and things get passed for a legislative body. The reason I love that movie is politics is the hero, not the villain. Yes, it is. That's why it's a great movie. And And often I'm called the villain because I'm in politics. Exactly. Music. Um, I'm a Phil Collins guy. Great. Genesis all day long. That's fantastic. A little bit of Susu Studio. It's it's not my favorite, but it's great. I I mean, I love country being from Kansas. I'm a huge Genesis fan. I love Phil Collins. uh, I hope to meet him someday before he goes the great by and by. Mm -hmm. I heard he's not playing drums anymore, which is a heartache. Yeah, it is. Adrian. Well, book is easy. Uh, Joseph Campbell here with A Thousand Faces. I think storytelling is the one (laughs) thing that absolutely unifies all of humanity that's the one thing we do together every culture every language every culture every, every language everybody that that notion of storytelling and the hero's myth that hero's journey is so it's so important to the way that we are right it's so fundamental say the title of the book again uh, joseph campbell hero with a thousand faces uh absolutely great stuff i would recommend it to anybody who's into either or all poetry playwriting journalism Mm -hmm. you know any kind of writing politics politicians all ought to read that because it really helps sort of form that narrative that i think is really important my best movie is a three-way tie Mm -hmm. right and so it's uh ferris bueller's day off Mm -hmm. um star wars episode four right the new hope a new hope uh and frankly the, the old classic Casablanca. Yeah, oh, it's one of the nice. funniest movies. Yep. Okay, I got the, a little the, bit more respect for you the, than I did the, before. The, the, <laughs> the, the humor is so understated and biting. Yes. In some places. It's just there. Mm-hmm. So, and and uh, anyway, I, I love the movie. And I love kind of that old timey romantic kind of everyone's on their honor, even exactly. if they're thieves, yes. right? That exactly. kind of a thing. Uh, I music. love that. And music on a long drive, I will tell you right now, um, or a long flight. I still have it, uh, but I will preface with um, a little bit of something that people don't know. When I was an undergrad at Arizona State, I was the lead male vocalist in the mariachi there. Nice. And so listening to uh, Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan's Centenario, their 100-year anniversary album, and yeah, that band's been around for 100 been, years. Wow. It is the epitome of mariachi. It's a big Cross-generational. Group. Cross-generational. It's really wonderful. They're all amazing musicians. Their album celebrating their 100th anniversary is one of the best pieces of music, and it is the standard as far as I'm concerned for mariachi music. I'd listen to that anytime. That's why the Especial is special. We get answers (laughs) like that. Adrian Fonta, Scott Schwab. We'll see you next week, folks. Thank you. Thanks.